Dr. Anthony Pisani is a faculty member of the Center for Study and, and Prevention of Suicide at the University of Rochester and the founder of SafeSide Prevention. Dr. Christine Moutier is the Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Hello, everybody. Really glad you could join us and very happy to have this wonderful panel here. It's been a uh, number of people got up very early today or are staying up late uh, to have a truly global uh, footprint here. And it's really a good time for that. It's a good time for global solidarity as we all uh, face uh, a, a common challenge in the coronavirus, although in different areas in, in, in many different ways. Yes, I would add my word of welcome to everyone, including our esteemed panelists. And I'm very excited that we have been able to gather you all up, four experts from four different continents, so that we can have a conversation and really share insights based on our own personal experiences and from your vantage point, um, to be able to highlight the concerns that are going on, as well as the actionable strategies to prevent suicide. Yeah, so I guess to start, um, you know, each of the panelists, I just want to say to you, thank you for being here. And also, um, you know, relieve you from having to represent, you know, your entire country or, or everybody with your perspective. We know that each of the countries here represented um, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, the US and Italy have had very different experiences with the virus itself, uh, with the kinds of measures that we've taken to, uh, to try to stem the virus. And uh, so you know, please feel free to just speak from your own perspective and vantage point uh, and uh, not having to represent everybody in your country or, or from your perspective. Great, so we'd like to introduce each of the panelists and um, uh, we'll give you a little brief uh, sense of who they are and then ask them to speak um, one by one also just a bit from their own experience. So I'll start with Dr. Yates Conwell. Dr. Conwell is the Vice Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and the Co-Director of the Center for the Study and Prevention of Suicide at the University of Rochester, specializing in geriatric psychiatry and suicide prevention. So Yates, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Christine and Tony and, and all of our colleagues here and around the world. I'm just so pleased and honored to be able to participate. So I'm here in the US and more specifically, I'm here in the state of New York, uh, where we've had overall in the US something like a million um, individuals affected by the COVID virus here in New York State, it's about 30% of that whole total. So we are kind of an epicenter here in the United States dealing with this crisis. Um, in uh, where I am in Rochester uh, is in Western New York. So you should know that that's quite a long way from New York City, which has had over half of all of the cases here in New York State. So we're fortunate where I work here at the University of Rochester to be a little bit removed from that uh, of the immediate crisis, but we've been able then to focus something uh, more on preparations, on making sure that we have the capacity for dealing with, uh, with this crisis, crisis as it moves west to Rochester, and also to attend very particularly, in our case, to the people with mental illness whom we serve in our department. My particular uh, focus is on older adults uh, as a particularly vulnerable population for a variety of reasons, and uh, hope to have an opportunity to talk more about that group here today, too. Wonderful. Thank you, Yates. Next, I will introduce Dr. Maurizio Pompili, who is a professor of psychiatry and suicidology at Sapienza University of Rome, Italy and the director of St. Andrea Hospital's Suicide Prevention Center. So Maurizio, would you say? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Tony. I am very happy to be here tonight, uh, tonight in Rome in Italy. Um, I'm very excited and thank you very much for uh, involving me in this uh, opportunity. Um, 
I am speaking from Rome, Italy, and uh, I guess uh, the Italian people will never forget uh, uh, February 21st um, of this year because we had the first uh, case uh, of COVID-19 in uh, Codogno, in, in the north part of Italy. And uh, at the beginning, it was something, it was so massive and uh, like a tsunami, but uh, was uh, just uh, in those regions and uh, we were uh, thankfully uh, far away from, from those regions. But after a while, we started uh, having uh, cases in our hospital and um, the difficulties have been so great in the management of uh, patients and also uh, the staff of organizing the staff, the fears of the people, uh, psychiatrists, uh, dealing with the psychiatric patients having the infection. Um, we had to change uh, everything about uh, how you are going to deal with this kind of patients having the infection in a teaching hospital where you have a, a residence, a students of any kind. Um, whatever, we had to reorganize everything. I'm a committed suicidologist uh, that founded uh, the first uh, suicide prevention center in Italy, and this is the only one um, in the country. And uh, we have been observing a, a change in the request of um, uh, caring for the suicidal patients. So probably I love the, the chance to talk about that later on. Me too. Thank you, Maurizio. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Paul Yip, who's a professor of population health in the Department of Social Work and Social Administration at, the, um, at Hong Kong University and the director of the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention, um, also at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Paul, would you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, Tony, Christine, and all others. I think it is uh, very early in Hong Kong, <laughs> early morning in Hong Kong. Like 4 a.m. <laughs> yes, but we can share with you some uh, more promising news. I think we have zero cases of each infection, I think, for the last two consecutive days. And uh, we do hope that I think this COVID-19, I think, can come down soon. I'm the director for the Center for Suicide Research and Prevention at the University of Hong Kong. And then, um, you know, in Hong Kong, I think um, for the uh, last six months, I think we have the social movement and now we have the COVID-19. So I think the mental uh, health challenges among the Hong Kong population is huge. And actually we are running a, a, a 24 hours online emotional support, I think for the community. And then we can see there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger. I think in the community. I think when they talk about the anxiety, they are worried about they will contract the COVID-19, the sadness we see, I think uh, the situation in Hong Kong, in China, in Italy, in America, I think, uh, I, I mean, we do share something in common. So I think we do have a, have a global challenges. So I think what we really want to do is, is to really like to share the wisdom of, um, of the practices and hopefully, I think we all can learn. And I think the anger sometimes is as toward the government. I think it is whether the uh, the initial or not the timely intervention. I think that is something that everyone is putting up now. So I do look forward for this conversation. Thank you so much, Paul. And you know, one of the things that you just reminded us of, I know, will be important in the Australian context as well, is that. You know, COVID didn't isn't the only thing that people are dealing with, and I'm sure everyone has has seen the bushfires that uh, that Australia was facing before this. Um, you know, and you know, in Hong Kong facing all the government protests. So it is um, good reminder that there's a lot of other things going on uh, as well. So that brings me to introduce to you uh, Carrie Lumby, who. Um, is um, a lived experience advocate working in mental health and suicide prevention systems and reform. Uh, she's currently support, <clears throat> focusing on supporting the lived experience co-design um, of the New South Wales Ministry of Health Towards Zero uh, initiative, which is uh, how we've, we've met. And um, Carrie, would you, would you say a little bit more about yourself? Sure, thanks, Tiny. It's really, really great to see everyone and to be with you um, early this morning for us. 
Um, so I'm a lived experience advocate, as you said, I'm living in Wollongong, which is a regional city near Sydney. And there I'm a member of a regional suicide prevention collaborative, which is really taking a ground up whole of community approach to reducing suicide in our region. I'm also working with Roses in the Ocean, which is a national uh, lived experience organisation supporting, as you say, the New South Wales Ministry of Health uh, Zero Towards Zero Suicides Initiative, particularly the lived experience co-design of what we're calling safe spaces, which um, are non-clinical peer-led supports for people in suicidal distress that are aiming to provide a genuine alternative to emergency departments and to a traditional risk assessment and management approach. And I guess in, in the context of this discussion, in Australia, we really recognise how very fortunate we are compared to many people in other countries. So our suicide prevention efforts are really focused largely on reducing the impact of the shutdown on social and on people's social and emotional well-being. And as you say, in our broader region here in Wollongong, um, the people have been impacted by these devastating bushfires. So it's also uh, making sure that we support those people um, that we're already in crisis. Thank you, Karen. And, and you can begin to hear just how many things are going on. I think that's going to be an important theme that, uh, you know, while there, there are some, there, we have, many of us have concerns, there's also a lot happening to help people. So as you can see, this is a fantastic panel and the time is going to go quickly. We're going to answer some questions and I'll take one right now that's already come up. Um, throughout the time, and we'll be following up on questions as well. So as Caroline mentioned at the beginning, you can enter questions into the with using the Q&A button. And we would also really appreciate if you go in there and can upvote questions that are of interest to you so that we can uh, try both during this hour and in follow-up conversations, be able to address the, one, the questions that are of, um, of, of, of interest to the greatest number of people. Uh, so we plan to send um, a summary after today of some takeaways from here. And um, so we, there'll be also polls that are popping up and um, you'll see one coming up now. If you could, if you'd like us to be in touch with um, materials, with our, the summary from today, with a link to recordings, um, just uh, go ahead and indicate your permission on the poll that will pop up and uh, we'll make sure to get you those resources and links. So thank you all very much. And uh, maybe Christine, can you uh, get us started? Yes, definitely. So Yates, I'm gonna start with you and ask you to provide some framing because this is an audience here with us today with a whole variety of levels of experience and types of experience with regard to suicide prevention. So if you could provide us with a bit of a framework for understanding suicide risk that might be a helpful place to start since the main part of our conversation is going to move towards um, action-oriented solutions. But that framework for risk uh, would be very helpful. Gates? Uh, sure, sure. It always helps me to have a framework to organize my thoughts. And certainly it's such a complicated topic, suicide, with many determinants. And no one of them explains all of suicide by any means. And then we layer on top of it uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic and all that that means in its so many dimensions and the impacts it has. But the way I tend to think about or offer a framework for suicide, we've called the four Ds because it's pretty easy to remember. All of them are impacted by this crisis. Uh, the first is depression. Uh, we heard Paul mention that the, the public is responding to this in many respects with dysphoria, with demoralization, and then in many people, including those who have a predisposition to develop clinical depressive illness or those who have never had it before, but potentially under great stress with a predisposition might manifest clinical depressive symptoms for the first time. And we know that depression is, is very closely related to suicide. It's not the whole story, but it's an important one to recognize because it's treatable. The second D uh, is disablement or disability. <clears throat> this is important um, because it's not just having a functional impairment, although that's, that's a challenge for so many people, particularly 
when the environment around them changes and, and uh, with COVID-19 and its impacts on our lives, it alters the context in which we live and do our work. Um, so where there becomes a mismatch between what we're able to do and what our environment enables us to do is a gap and people can fall through that. And that too, we know is a risk factor for suicide. A third is uh, D is disconnectedness. And I think the uh, implications for the situation we're in now with, uh, with the coronavirus pandemic are, are just obvious to everyone where people across the world have been restricted to homes and uh, cautioned about social distancing or physical distancing more appropriately, I think. With the impacts that has on our ability to relate to friends, draw on support, rates of loneliness increase potentially. And we know those too are factors associated with suicide worldwide. And then the, the fourth D, I, I think we need to keep in mind is for deadly means that is access to uh, uh, lethal means for people who may either thoughtfully or impulsively reach war in the U.S. off a firearm uh, and make a, an irreversible decision. So access to those means is something we need to think very carefully about. Uh, and in the United States, as I said, firearms, we've seen from one year ago uh, an 85% increase in the number of new firearm uh, purchases that were made in the month of March. So this is a, really a dramatic um, factor for us to track as well. So I'd offer the four Ds, but recognize that there are other factors that we need to be aware of, be sensitive to, uh, that have different kinds of implications for people in different countries and at different points in the life course. Thank you, Yates. Appreciate that uh, helpful and very memorable way of thinking about it. Uh, there have been a couple of questions that I think are really going to be answered in this next uh, segment. So uh, Richard Jackson and some other people asked, uh, do we think that there's going to be an uptick in suicides in the next one to two years? And uh, Laura Duncan and others um, also asked, you know, what would be the group where we might see the biggest uptick? And uh, I think that provides a transition into our next topic because I think what we really want to focus on is um, I think there is some risk that there could be, but um, what I'm really what I think we're really interested in having a conversation about is we know that that's not inevitable. Uh, while there could be, there doesn't have to be. Uh, suicide is preventable, and so I'd like to um, kind of turn to the group here and. Um, and talk about, okay, given that there are some concerns, let's, let's think about, you know, what are, the, what are some groups that, that, that really need particular focus right now? And, um, and also, what, uh, what, you know, what, what are your perspectives on providing uh, those kinds of supports for people? Um, and maybe, Carrie, if you could, uh, could sort of start us off on what you're observing in terms of uh, the kinds of... Uh, you know, groups or demographics or, or kinds of concerns that we should focus on and some ideas about, about where, and then we can just sort of let the, the conversation flow from there. Thanks, Tony. Um, well, I mean, I can't provide that kind of high level research perspective on this. So I'm speaking really about my on the ground experience and particularly in our region. I think what it's really revealing is the sort of people that were already um, uh, disproportionately impacted by mental ill health and suicide because of structural inequalities. We, it, that's really being laid bare, um, first by the bushfires and then now um, the way in that's been compounded. I think I'd also say that um, while there's been this rapid push to um, move to digital health, big buckets of money, and it's fantastic that we're really, really adopting that. And it's, um, it, it is a great thing that you also see that there's a digital equity gap that's also being laid bare, that's really compounding the structural drivers um, of mental ill health and suicide. So I guess that for me is a particular area of concern. And obviously that's the, there's also a long view issue about how to close the digital, the, the gap in the digital divide that, that is really widening. 
That's helpful. Yeah. And I think we should, we'll, we'll want to circle back to that about ideas about how we might, uh, you know, given that not everybody has access to, uh, so for example, if we now have video conference, um, you know, telehealth visits, well, that's good, but not if, every, if everybody doesn't have access. So some of those things that you just raised, structural inequalities, uh, you know, potential access but, uh, and being technologically isolated might cut across um, the different groups. Uh, Paul, I, I wonder um, from, you know, I know that, I know that you, um, you know, wrote some of the really um, influential papers from a past uh, epidemic in, in Hong Kong. Um, if you could briefly summarize, what would you say are the are the couple of of groups that might that we want to have special concern for, and then maybe some ideas about about reaching those groups? Yes, thank you, Tony. I think we have learned the painful experiences from the SARS uh, in two hundred three in Hong Kong. I think we have uh, seen an excessive number of suicide. I think during that year, I think um, sometimes I think what we have observed. I think uh, there is a um, very excessive increase in, in the number of the older adult suicide. I think um, um, it is sometimes it's due to the isolation and then uh, because of the quarantine measure, it induces anxieties and then the fears. And also at that time, we have a very historical high unemployment rate and which actually has a very uh, significant impact, I think to the middle aged men. I think that is one of the problems we are dealing with. And what we have seen so far, I think uh, when we look at, at the COVID-19, there's a lot of discussion on about how to uh, reinforce the quarantine measure, the social distancing, but there's not much sufficient attention, I think, to be paid. I think, what can we do to help these people? I think if they observe the social distancing, if they are being quarantined, self-imposed self quarantine for 14 days, right? What sort of support that we can give them? I think what we have seen, there's a number of, of the relapse of the depression. I think there's some people who are mentally not well already, but because of the quarantine, it actually, I think it, uh, it took off, I think some of the underlying problems. So I think in the whole discussion we are talking about, yes, I think doing the the sort of quarantine is very really important to ensure the epidemic doesn't take off, it's very really important. But at the same time, please, I think pay more attention, I think, to the mental health. It's not only the economy, I think it's not only the so-called this sort of um, uh, epidemic control, but at the same time, don't forget, I think they are the people there. I think the mental health, I think, need uh, to be looked at. Yeah. And we might add to that one of the questions that just came in from uh, Jackie Garrick was about, um, you know, also the people who are health professionals taking care of, of patients. I'm sure, um, you know, uh, Maurizio, that's probably been a special uh, concern there. Um, what are some ways that you've seen, maybe Maurizio, you could touch on this. What are some ways that you've seen kind of positive steps being taken to um, you know, address the needs of, of those helping professionals or any of the people in the areas, other areas that, uh, that Paul mentioned. Uh, how, how are you supporting that? Because you're always a kind of a couple of weeks ahead of us. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe tell us, you know, what you see going on in terms of steps in that direction. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, well, um, actually, it started with the impact on uh, um, doctors and nurses because uh, newspapers uh, started reporting a lot of uh, uh, suicides uh, among doctors and nurses, uh, either uh, because of uh, hard uh, shifts or because the fear of contagion or uh, the fear uh, to infect other people. Um, at the beginning, it was, uh, I mean, at the beginning of March, it was uh, just uh, uh, an excess of suicides uh, among uh, this uh, category. Uh, then uh, we started uh, observing uh, some uh, uh, fear among uh, the lay people, and uh, we have been receiving calls from people um, just worried about uh, the, the disease, the infection. And uh, after that, uh, it started uh, coming out uh, um, the fear of uh, the economic crisis, uh, the, the, the impact on the un unemployment, uh, uh, the fact that uh, people are just uh, um, uh, worried about the future. Uh, they have a kind of a, 
uh, hopeless uh, feeling about the, the, the future and the quarantine had have been uh, having a great impact on the on the Italian people so far. I'll just chime in, and um, Mauricio, thank you for laying that out. What I notice going on is that while those huge, you know, for some, this is, this is a traumatic experience, either because of being frontline or because of becoming sick, a family member becoming sick, or the death of, of someone in our lives. And um, what I see happening is, is, is a conversation around these very difficult and real experiences that in some ways is taking the stigma away. There's this sort of leveling effect that everyone is ready to talk about depression, loss, grief, suffering, and how to stay connected with others. And these, these sort of sh the show of solidarity, if you will. Um, and, and I just wondered if, if some of you might touch upon that, that piece, that are there examples that you're seeing where uh, communities are coming together and expressing support, either for the frontline workers um, or for those who are sick. You know, I'm, I'm seeing that happen both on, in my local community as well as nationally here in the United States, really remarkably in ways that, that I've never seen before. Yeah, uh, um, well, actually, uh, it's been a, a, a general, um, a sense of solidarity among Italian people in a way. Uh, this general support acted uh, um, in the, a kind of reduction of uh, suicide risk uh, uh, among people. Uh, but there are also vulnerable individuals that are um, uh, the, the ones that we are more concerned about because uh, uh, these people um, uh, actually have a, a kind of human misery apart from a, a psychiatric disorder that can play a, a role in the precipitation of suicide risk, but there is a, there's a human misery and we um, don't want to run the risk to uh, actually medicalize this kind of uh, um, uh, in, inner uh, uh, mental pain. So our perspective is to understand both the psychiatric disorder uh, as a professor of psychiatry actually, but also as a human being um, with an, an empathic feeling about the people that cannot see the future, that are uh, concerned about uh, how to go on with the, with the children, with the family, and so on. It is really hard to deal with this stuff because you don't have a, um, a rapid solution for that. They phone us, they want a solution, but we actually don't have that. But we can listen to them um, empathically, and that, that makes the difference. Well, and we also see the people, they are, you know, in Hong Kong or in many places, I think they are running out of this face mask. And then, but now we can see there is a concerted effort, not from, not from the government, no? it is from the local, <laughs> from the community themselves. No? I think they try all the ways, I think, to collect the masks. And sometimes I think we even send the masks, I think, to the foreign country. I mean, for those people who do not have this. So I think this is so sharing, is caring. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, there's a movement. I think it is in Hong Kong now. I think we are talking about if you see a caretaker, if you do not see him, uh, he or her have a mouth, uh, the face mask, I think if you have a spare one, I mean, do share with them just to show mm. your kindness. I think that's a, that's a little thing that we can do. Of course, I think the government is trying to do something now, but I think it is very important. I think that we, we, we can we can deploy some of our resources, I think, to help those people uh, just next door. It's not necessarily we know them, you know, but I think it is just something that we can try to do. And then that's also what we have seen in Hong Kong. With generosity. Yeah. Carrie, you were about to say something? Yeah, I just think that that sense of kind of compassionate solidarity and sort of community, strength of community, is having um, quite a striking effect on people that have traditionally felt very socially isolated perhaps from their circumstances, but maybe specifically their sense of social disconnect and disconnectedness from their 
lived experience of suicide, particularly chronic suicidality. And they're actually saying that they feel finally that people are, can get what those feelings are like and that it's making them feel more connected actually to other people. I mean, someone recently said to me that they feel like their internal world's been externalized for the first time and they feel that it's being validated by hearing that other people feel vulnerable as well. Wow, that is just so, so powerful. I think sometimes we forget either as leaders or as healthcare providers or scientists that one of the most powerful things in the science, but in our human experience is that that need to be cared for, to be known and understood. And um, it is a time when some very interesting sort of unanticipated positives are, are happening in the dialogue. And of course you worry about those who aren't able to participate or, or receive and feel that, um, you know, that sense of support and connection. There is a question actually coming in and um, Yates or anyone else this might be a good one for you. It's about older adults and um, being a high risk population, both in terms of suicide risk in most places around the globe, as well as in terms of the impact of COVID. And are there, are there some ways that you've thought about that could either engage them um, and support them more socially um, or, or other sort of strategies that, that you've thought about? Mm, sure, sure. Thank you for the question. I did want to tack on something to the to the last discussion, which is I'm I'm awfully glad to hear, and and particularly from you, Carrie, that that things are opening up and there's a more uh, openness and acceptance to different kinds of lived experience. Loneliness is a stigmatized state. People don't people are embarrassed to say I'm lonely. It's just not particularly a manly thing to say. Um, and so I do believe that that is changing. This is an extraordinary opportunity to actually change the cultural mores about talking about one's state that way. What, I, what I'm worried about uh, is that we don't lose the opportunity to raise the discussion of suicide and suicide risk in that same conversation, because I do fear that rates will rise. And we need to be anticipating that and encompassing suicide and that as being something people think about uh, as part of the, the same conversation. But back to what you were asking, Christine, older people certainly are a vulnerable group here for a lot of reasons. Physically, because of the comorbidities, we know that that's what makes for some more, more severe reaction um, and course of illness higher. Uh, likelihood of death as a function of the infection, um, a higher impact on immune function, which in a problematic way then increases the likelihood of getting the infection, so on and so forth. More social isolation because of associated uh, functional disability. Um, so all of those things make us very concerned about the older adult population. But at the same time, again, one of these good news, bad news things, part of the characteristic of older people is that they got old and they did so as survivors, that they, they've learned a lot over time, including uh, about how to manage in crises. Uh, one of the natural aspects of aging, psychological aging, is to become more selective in the nature of the relationships that, that give people that sense of social engagement and caring and belonging. Uh, and it becomes uh, more of a, a deeper kind of relationship to fewer other people than is typically the case normally for younger and middle-aged folks. So in some respects, older people are ready for uh, this kind of situation if we can provide them with the tools uh, to prevent that disablement that I talked about to make their environment actually work for them under the new rules of physical distancing. Um, and, um, and also to, to recognize that older people also have something to contribute, not just less burden versus more burden, but actually learning from the older person in our lives or in, on our streets or in our building and in our neighborhood about 
what they can offer us by way of the lived experience that they have in how better to uh, manage the challenges here. I think it's an exciting time in that odd way. Yeah, I, I think you know, when we think about what are the things that are needed, and we, we actually we have a colleague, um, uh, uh, Kim Van Orden, who'd worked on sort of volunteer interventions to reduce loneliness and suicide risk. And I think it's that kind of thing. Can we think about how to harness? And I think the same thing, there was a, um, an earlier question from uh, uh, Mary Wade about school counselors. What can school counselors do? So the other end of the spectrum of people that we often think of as as sort of having a lot of um, needs and concerns to students who are not in school, there are also people who have a lot to give um, and, um, and, and probably a lot to give to older adults, you know? Um, and so, so that, you know, but there's, a, there's, 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 um, so I think we, we, we're, we're starting to get, in, and Paul, you know, something that you said before about, you know, needing there to be conversation like this. I think these are the sorts of conversations that can happen. We have, done an amazing job in one month or two months in transforming our healthcare system so that it's focused on digital health. Um, you know, there've been, uh, you know, temporary right now uh, allowances for things that many of us advocated for for a long time. And I know, uh, Carrie, you know, you know, but corresponded, there's also been a lot of resources uh, from the Australian government. Uh, I think within while, while we were still trying to kind of figure out if the coronavirus was a thing, there was already the, you know, the, the, the PM had announced $1.1 billion towards mental health. Um, so I wonder if we could hear some additional ideas and examples of things that, um, that there's people, a number of people here I can see from, from questions and from titles who are really in leadership roles. Um, what can they be advocating for? I think one is the, creating the kinds of infrastructures to allow people who might be vulnerable to be contributors and giving. Uh, what are some other things that you all think, uh, you know, we can advocate for in, in this time? Well, I think the social distancing here, I think what we have found out that I think the older adults, they're most vulnerable. Because what happened now, I think during the quarantine time, I think the visitors are not allowed to go to the hospital, the age home, I think they will not allow visitors. And also most of the elderly center are being closed. And then the library, the museum, the swimming pool, you know, I mean, all these uh, some of time is the lifeline of the older adults. So I think we really have to uh, 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 show some feasibility. I think without compromising on the safety issue, I think we should allow, I think to have more space, I think for the older adults, because I think uh, what happened, I, I mean, sometimes I think they much worrying, I think then just uh, to reinforcing the rule but without paying sufficient attention to this. Now, some of the good practices, what I've been doing now, I think some uh, of the older adults, they are giving a, uh, an iPad, I think such that they can meet, their relative FaceTime, even they cannot allow to visit them. So I think they still build up this uh, connection, I think, with the relative, which are very important, I think, to their recovery. So I think this is, there, are, there, are, there are many ways that we really have to think a bit more. I think not just to impose just this uh, quarantine, but at the same time, please, I think this mental health situation, it is acute. I think we do need to do something about it. Well, um, here in Italy, we have been uh, thinking about that uh, a great deal, um, especially because uh, for uh, very uh, delicate things uh, such as not uh, celebrating funerals, uh, uh, not uh, having the opportunity to say goodbye to the dear ones. And this has been a very um, a great impact of the, the people around here. And also um, not having the opportunity to go to the uh, Sunday masses, uh, it was um, um, a, a real traumatic experience for, for many people. Uh, but uh, in the end, many priests uh, discovered the fact that they could uh, celebrate uh, the, the mass uh, um, with the, um, 
broadcasting it through um, uh, Facebook or other uh, um, social networks. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, a kind of a web platform could allow to have uh, this access to everybody, especially for the elderly people that uh, don't uh, have uh, uh, the access to the internet uh, at hand, uh, um, it, it, it would reduce uh, the impact of um, this um, infection. Yeah. You know, I, I thought I would just highlight one more thing that came up in our discussion beforehand that as if you are in a position of leadership, either a political position or of a, of a workplace or a healthcare organization, clearly anything you do to make mental health a priority, not only taking the stigma out of dialogue, but, but just freely um, sending that message very strongly that we all have mental health, just like we have physical health. And so this is something that all of us must attend to all of the time, whether we have a mental health condition or not. It's, it's just a basic human experience and to help others as well, to encourage that culture of safety. Um, Carrie, there was one question, um, perhaps before we wrap up this part of the conversation, about safe spaces and what did you mean when you said that and could that be something that could be implemented in other countries? Yeah, so I was going to say that um, if um, from a lived experience perspective, what we really want leaders to advocate for is the development of peer support. So they're supports, uh, non-clinical supports um, that are staffed by people with a lived experience and they can bring their you know, uniquely valuable expertise. And there's an emerging evidence base um, that that mutual understanding that comes with uh, that, that common lived experience really does promote recovery, hope, healing, all of the things that we know that we talk about that we know are so important um, in reducing suicide risk. Um, so safe spaces are just a, 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 um, one type of um, peer support and they're really like drop-in spaces that are there to, to really just reduce distress in a warm, welcoming environment. People with lived experience are there as peer workers. I know that in America there's some really cool stuff that's already been done and we're actually drawing on the practical wisdom of people leading the way there. Um, and um, they really, um, it's really um, proven that you don't need to, as Tony knows very well, that um, assessing people in a risk managed way does not, is not actually helpful. And it's, um, for a lot of us, it's been a very traumatic experience. And as um, someone said before, we don't need to pathologize emotional pain often, we just need to be able to um, have some, someone to sit in with our distress and to let us talk and be heard. Yes, so powerful. It's very helpful, very helpful. Uh, you know, I, th I think just to maybe piggybacking on that a little bit uh, and maybe bringing us back to the idea about digital, you know, telehealth, you know, I think, Carrie, you're bringing up a really important point that like, okay, we want to have telehealth, we want to bridge, make sure that everybody has access to it, but what are we doing with that telehealth? Um, and one of the things that, you know, is really a, a concern for me is that, um, you know, what we do matters, but how we do it matters more. And so I would say another, you know, it, it, I think we're kind of gathering some, some, some action items here, you know, one, providing opportunities for people to connect who might be seen as vulnerable, you know, or two, developing that, this is a great time to develop the peer workforce. Mm -hmm. And third, making sure that we do have a workforce that is really prepared to make adjustments uh, to, to these new contexts, to be able to, in just even a very concrete way, if, if you are a leader in a healthcare organization, thinking about uh, equipping the workforce with tools to update their uh, plans and assessments and approaches with people given the new contexts. Um, would be another kind of actionable step is not making sure that we don't um, in the midst of the urgency of the virus, lose track of the need for continuing to develop the workforce and, 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 and give people, um, you know, have, have a strong peer workforce and a clinical workforce that can come together and, uh, and have the tools and abilities to make those adjustments. 
I think that's, that's really important. And allow all of your staff and volunteers to have access to suicide prevention training. That would be one simple step that any leader could take that would uh, make a big difference if that hasn't happened in your organization. Yeah. Um, Tony, I think we want to move to a couple of the most um, upvoted questions uh, very soon. But I thought before we do that, is there a burning thought that um, any of the panelists have that you haven't been able to share so far? You know, I've been thinking about what, what we're hearing so much about in, in our country now is contact tracing. It, it's an interesting concept. It, it certainly challenges so many of our fears and assumptions about privacy and confidentiality. It just just to throw it out there, I think we need to get very creative in understanding, you know, that that's awfully closely connected somehow to the notion of social connections. I don't know, there must be something there that a clever person could do to make <laughs> contact tracing actually a helpful thing for the individual. Right. Like but they always, yes, they always say that we need to keep the sufficient distance apart, but at the same time, we still have to feel the emotion closeness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a very delicate balance. I think how to keep the privacy at the same time, I think, uh, uh, I think we have to uh, ensure these people, they do not feel they are being forgotten. I think we also like the sustainable development goals say that we leave no one behind. I think it's very important. I think, I think uh, when this disconnection, there's so much intrinsic in our society now, how can we, uh, this sort of tracing, this sort of connectivity can be constructed in a way that I think we do feel comfortable at the same time, it's not too intrusive. Yeah, and one thing, I mean, so, uh, maybe Carrie, I wonder if you could speak to this. Uh, you know, one of the Yates was bringing up, you know, so there's these technological stuff that's coming up, including around ways, I think there's gonna be increasing ways that people are gonna be addressing the, the spread of the virus itself using new technologies, which will bring them into our lives. Um, I know that you've talked about the, um, the, the um, work around co-design. Could you mm -hmm. talk about the concept of co-design and how that might uh, take place uh, in terms of some of the technological innovations that are, that are taking place? Yeah, co-design has become a bit of a buzzword, at least in Australia, but when you do it genu genuinely in collaboration with lived experience experts, um, then we know already in sort of the analog health space that that is the only way to get uh, to, to achieve um, services that people want and need. Um, could, and could you actually, I'm sorry to interrupt, could you actually say, because it's not a buzzword in every country yet, so maybe just explain what, what it is and... and um, yeah, then how it, how that, how that might help in, in the so in context. Process. Yeah, sure. In the context of the healthcare sector, it's the idea that you um, you don't just tell people that we want a service and then consult people with lived experience or particularly service users about what that might look like. You actually, from the ground up, you co-define the problem with um, healthcare stakeholders and then lived experience and other community stakeholders. Um, and often um, that's really being done a lot um, in, in these, the rollout of the Ministry of Health Towards Zero Suicides initiatives where lived experience is at the centre of the um, development and delivery of services. Um, and so I think in the digital health, it's, it's the same issue, but I think there's a unique opportunity for um, the sector to partner with tech companies and to do co-design initiatives with people with a lived experience, particularly that I think the unique opportunity is people that have been really hard to reach in traditional, traditionally with suicide prevention efforts. If, if you could think of ways to do code design with those people, you'd be actually um, reaching them and um, providing services they would want and need um, and addressing the issues that we haven't been able to address with traditional services. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity going forward. That's great. And the, there's a related question that really in a way is much more basic, but it's the most upvoted question today, which is around the effectiveness of digital telemental health services in general. And, um, you know, I'll just start by saying that we, in this country, we probably for far too long made it hard for providers to actually provide it because of lots of restrictions around 
state lines and licensing and in-person necessities and so forth. And now with COVID, suddenly overnight, that changed and um, has become much, much more accessible to Americans to have both medical and mental health treatment. And there are wonderful studies of many different types of modalities of treatment, including cognitive behavioral therapy, that show its effectiveness um, close to or just as well as in-person treatment. So, but does anyone else want to say something about this? Because I think this is really a very, very important topic that we hope will, um, that we take with us past the, the COVID experience, that, that that has been opened up around the globe. Yeah, uh, of course, um, this is a very uh, great opportunity for uh, mental health and psychiatry to uh, develop a new perspective of uh, digital mental health. But uh, we are just uh, at the beginning because uh, we must uh, switch from the uh, patient-doctor relationship face-to-face um, uh, -to, -face to the digital um, medicine. And um, my uh, thoughts uh, go to many patients that uh, I haven't seen for uh, two months and they are looking for me each day, uh, but are not allowed to contact them uh, through um, uh, Skype or, or, or other uh, platforms uh, uh, because uh, there is um, the need to protect the privacy. Uh, they are not probably um, protected for um, uh, the, the, the privacy matters. So we need to develop a, a very tight uh, platforms uh, for uh, controlling um, hikers uh, or uh, other uh, people that can access uh, uh, probably invol involuntarily, um, but can uh, have access to private data. So uh, this is a very delicate matter. And uh, as I said, I have many patients are looking for me at this time, but I'm not able to uh, reach them. That's a really helpful reminder that there's such variation across different regions. And there's many, of course, many, 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 many regions not represented here. We, could, we, we hope to continue these conversations and maybe we can have um, you know, other areas and perspectives represented. Just one word about this. So I think in, some, in those places where those changes have occurred, I think there's a, the, there's a danger that uh, we might go back all, as far as I know, a lot of the, um, and Christine, you and I, I think we're talking about this earlier, that um, many of the uh, allowances that are now in place that are permitting this telehealth revolution are explicitly temporary. I have a feeling it's going to be pretty hard to go back. Uh, once we've been doing this for several months, I, I think it's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. Um, and so I think that'd be something to kind of keep our, keep our eyes on. If I could add two quick points about that. One is that in, I, I'm pretty sure you're right that we're, there's a risk of sliding back, but the real challenge is two. One is what the future looks like. It's, it's not, I don't believe, just more telemental health care delivery. It's about using um, digital platforms for what in other settings we might call a stepped care approach, is that finding personalized digital interventions for people that they like, that they enjoy, that engage them, because that's really the, the barrier to a lot of, uh, of digital interventions. Uh, and I think there's room for a great deal of creativity there. The other, though, is um, I think something that, that, again, Carrie referred to was that, that even though, so in Australia, you've got, I guess, 70% of the population has a smartphone, 30% don't. And the likelihood is that those 30% are among that segment of the population that is going to get left behind unless we actually make a very determined effort to bridge that gap. Absolutely. That's great. Um, well, our time is flying by like we had anticipated. And um, so we'll, we'll need to come, we'll need to take this conversation uh, to a close in just a moment. Um, but I'm, I'm so struck by the, the really um, wonderful and important questions that are coming up. Um, and so I'll just hit on a couple of them before giving a little closing remark. That one question is about the use of safety planning. And is there any reason that we can't do safety planning 
um, with our patients or clients during a time like this. And you know, I would say for, for a long time now, we've had wonderful digital apps that, um, that promote the use of a person developing their own safety plan. Now, oftentimes that is in the context with the therapeutic relationship, but if you are some, if you're a therapist or a treatment provider giving, uh, doing patient care digitally, this is a wonderful supplement to have them engage in safety planning, walk them through that and introduce one of those apps so that they can make it their own. And the other um, question that's coming up is if you're a family member and you're worried about somebody, well, I mean, that, that's a much bigger conversation. Um, and the main thing is expressing loving concern and inviting them into a dialogue really where you're doing more listening than talking and, and, and encourage them to seek treatment. If there is any sign of thinking of suicide or deterioration in mental health that is significant. And the one other thing I would say for any one of us is now is a time especially where it's important to make your home environment safe, comfortable, secure, but also safe. And that means securing all lethal means. Like we started out this conversation talking about, I think Yates, you had mentioned um, the firearm sales and in other parts of the world, it might be other lethal means that are um, more important to think about. But this is both in terms of, this is a suicide prevention measure that any one of us can take. It's also a way to prevent accidental injury if there are children in the home. Um, we know that calls to the poison lines are up right now, and a lot of that is the aggressive use of cleaning agents, but, but also children under five are represented, uh, overrepresented in that group as well. Um, so I will just give my own um, summative remarks here and then turn it back over to Tony to close us out. So I hope that, that you all have really taken from this conversation that while there are significant concerns about the COVID pandemic and what that might mean for suicide risk, especially for those vulnerable populations, that suicide is preventable. It's not an inevitable outcome of COVID or of any other situation. And so, but we must act now. And there are numerous um, negative forces at play related to COVID, but many of those are addressable in the ways that we have been discussing. Um, and, and I do think there are sort of two or three really big silver linings um, at least in the United States, that we are taking out of it. One is quite universal, I think, and that is how the, the, there's been sort of a resetting of our cultural norms around getting connected to each other. That has become such a theme. And if, if that reset can, if we can hold on to that beyond this moment, um, that could actually have a significant preventive effect. Also, as we had discussed earlier, the stigma that, that has traditionally surrounded the topic of suffering, loneliness, mental anguish, pain, anxiety, um, all of those things, that is now on everyone's minds and everyone is free to talk about it. And thank you, Carrie, for expressing that so beautifully in terms of what that has done powerfully for many people with lived experience. Um, and, and the last one is this obvious and wonderful point, at least in the US, about telehealth services suddenly becoming much more available, which um, could be a game changer actually for access to effective mental health care and preventing suicide. So Tony, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, I've never seen, in some ways, never seen so much attention to mental health and I think we can take advantage of that and, um, and, and, and don't let the, that, uh, that focus uh, kind of wane away as we start to open up uh, more, uh, more, 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 uh, more of these restrictions. I just really want to thank you, Christine, uh, very much. I appreciate you uh, kind of co-hosting here with me. I want to thank uh, Caroline Kelberman and Aaron Dupre and Ken Tryon for helping us today. And uh, Carrie, Paul, Maurizio, Yates, uh, thank you so much for contributing your experiences and your wisdom here. And I'm looking forward to continuing this this conversation with you and, and, and others. We'll follow up with a summary from today and some links as well as a recording for those um, you'd like to share it with. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining today. I know there's a lot going on, so we appreciate the time. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you very much, Tony and Christine.
Thanks, Maurizio. Thank you. Okay. It was a real pleasure uh, to join you and uh, very exciting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So we Do really you appreciate are. your work now and, and, and throughout, uh, throughout suicide prevention. Thank I think one thing I like, to, I do like to say that if we can connect, at least connect two individuals who are more vulnerable, and I think the epidemic of care and support can spread faster than, than the COVID nineteen. I love that. Mm, I like that. Yes, we can. The it can spread. Love is contagious. <laughs> all right. Thank you, all. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.